Well, as you just heard earlier, um, this is actually my second chance to see you all at the Maritime Forum, having been in Copenhagen two years ago. And we've had two um, proverbs earlier from Africa and Asia. I'd like to add a third one into the mix, something that's not so much a proverb but used to be a curse, which is a great Chinese saying, may you live in interesting times. May you live in interesting times. And we certainly do live in extraordinarily interesting times that have implications not just for global businesses around the world, but particularly for the maritime industry right now. On the way here, I was thinking about some of the things that have changed in the last couple of years since um, I was here before. And I jotted down five key themes of things that have changed in the world that I think have implications for the industry and will shape a lot of the discussion in the next couple of days. First thing is good news, which is that since we last gathered in 2016, the global economy has continued to grow and the economic growth has intensified. Um, that wasn't necessarily clear two years ago, but the global economy is indeed growing, and that is thoroughly good news. Second theme is that the debate around the environment has intensified, partly because the costs of climate change have become even clearer, but also the search for solutions have intensified. And as the Honorable Mrs. Lamb just said, there is a very intense debate at almost every government around the world now about how to find ways to ameliorate the environmental issues, which of course has a lot of implications for the maritime industry that you'll be talking about. Thirdly, the discussion about digitization and technology has intensified. There's been a lot of discussion in the US, where I live in the last couple of years, about self-driving cars, self-driving machines, soon to be self-driving ships, perhaps. And the question of how the maritime industry is going to seize the opportunities offered by digital technologies is another big theme of the next two days. Fourth change, this digital revolution is changing manufacturing. Even before the rise of Donald Trump, and there was a time before the rise of Donald Trump, there was a very intense discussion going on amongst manufacturers, amongst the consumer goods industry, about how digital technologies could change the supply chain, logistics, shipping, um, transport links, issues like 3D printing, issues like regionalization rather than globalization were already on the agenda. But the fifth big change, of course, in some ways the one that has overshadowed everything else, has indeed been the rise of the era of Donald Trump. His administration has shaken up the global order, but it's also a symptom of a much bigger shift right around the world towards growing populism, growing patriotism, if you're another P, or nationalism, and growing protectionism, the three Ps. Populism, patriotism, and protectionism. They, in many ways, are the rising theme of the world at the moment, not just in America, but epitomized by the debate in America. And that, of course, has led to a big shake-up in the trading debate, in a way that, frankly, would have been completely unimaginable five years ago, perhaps even two years ago, when we gathered in Copenhagen. What does that mean? For the shipping industry, well, it's going to be a big discussion point in the next couple of days. And we're going to be talking about these issues both through discussions on this podium, through panel discussions, also through a series of breakout events. And essentially, there's going to be a two-day journey, if you like, through a series of working discussions, reconvening back in the panel, and then breaking out. We're gonna be asking everybody to essentially work, not just listen, but work and talk. You can see the first day's map, if you like, up on the screen, um, where we're gonna essentially be starting with a panel discussion, then breaking out, then coming back again, and then essentially trying to sum up some of the key themes. 
And then on the second day, if we can have the second day up, we'll then be essentially intensifying that discussion to try and prod all of you into not just networking and getting to know each other a bit in these panel groups, but also trying to hammer out some collective solutions to addressing some of these key themes. As you heard earlier from Peter, one of the key goals of this event is to try and bring the industry together from around the world and not just get to know each other better, but to try and forge some kind of shared understanding, some collaborative solution-focused discussions about how to address the issues of the environment, of technology, of changing trading flows, so that you can truly work together to try and build a better maritime industry for the future. So, to start the discussion off and frame these debates, I'm going to now invite three panelists onto stage for a discussion about, about the future of the industry. Um, I think they're known to most of you, but we have Dr. Victor Fung, who is a group chairman of the Fung Group, um, a legendary linchpin of the global trading system, supply chains. I'd like to invite you onto stage, please. We have Meredith Sumter, who's the chief research um, Sorry, Head of Research and Strategy at the Eurasia Group in the US. Um, that's a political advisory group that's risen to prominence in the recent years. And last but not least, we have Dr. Alicia Garcia Herrero, who's Chief Economist of Natixis, um, who's going to give us a European perspective on geopolitics. So can the three panelists come on stage, please? OK. Great. Well, thank you all very much indeed for coming up here. And as I said, we do live in very, very interesting times for good and bad. And I should congratulate the conference organizers both on your fantastic sense of timing in holding the event right now, but also your great sense of location because meeting here in Hong Kong right now is indeed in many ways fascinating place to be, not just because of what Hong Kong is doing to prepare itself for the next um, era of maritime um, organization, but also in terms of our situation between the US and China right now. So I'd like to start with you, Dr. Fang, and ask you, you have spent many decades at the center of global supply chains and trading flows. Um, you were at the center of the growth of cheap Asian manufacturing connecting up with Western consumer markets. We're now at a point when some people are questioning whether that's going to change given the rising US-China trade tensions. How do you read the current state of play for the global shipping industry and the US-China relationship? Okay, uh, well, first of all, you know, thank you very much for that question. Before I start, I'd just like to thank the forum for having me here. Uh, you know, we're a very uh, 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 active player in the whole market. It's great to see many of our partners here today, and I, I think I, I'm really happy to be here. And of course, Hong Kong is my home, so welcome to Hong Kong. Um, to answer your question, I think uh, I, I would look at it this way. I think there's going to be a fairly major shift in the way the global supply chains will be conducted going forward. Now, this is not occasioned, in a sense, by the current trend or Mr. Trump. Or, it's a trend that has already started, but is absolutely exacerbated and accelerated by what, what has happened. I think the, the first thing I would like to say is I'm seeing a much deeper integration of the economies and the supply chain among the Asian countries as a first step. Uh, I think the whole thing goes back to really a focus on the country of origin. You see, right now, if you look at the basis of the conflict between U.S. and China, it's the fact that the products finished in China being shipped to the U.S. are subject to very high tariffs. But if you look at the supply chains behind those, maybe 30% of the value added is in China, and the rest of it, the supply chain is global. right? So really what I see now is a major trend in which people are now looking for new places to finish, to do the final finishing. 
It doesn't mean that China is going to be out of the global supply chain at all. They could be supplying a lot of the upstream, right? So instead of finishing the product in China, people are now saying, can we finish in Vietnam? Can we finish in Bangladesh? Or maybe even further, can we finish it in uh, Egypt? Can we finish it in India, etc.? So the, the fundamental thing that we want to look at when we look at this whole US-China trade conflict is the US consumer still needs to consume. It just doesn't come from China, country of origin China. They're looking for country of origin somewhere else. So what, what I really see is actually, as a result of this, a much deeper integration of the different stages of production around other parts of the country, and then a search and, frankly, an opportunity for some of the newer developing economies to participate in global trade and to actually bootstrap themselves up the economic ladder as a result of this. Now, my final comment, just to finish this off, is China actually started this trend 10 years ago mm. to, in fact, down, download the, uh, in a sense, the, the, the lower value added part of the whole manufacturing process. But it's been not, it's been, you know, proceeding, but now it's a drastic move. And, and it's just accelerated that trend. Right, so not so much a rupture of trading flows, more a reshaping of trading flows Correct. that was underway slowly, even before we entered this current period of rising protectionism and populism. Well, that's an optimistic way of seeing well, this, this change. Evolution, not revolution. Meredith, would you agree? Or how seriously do you look at the current, or how concerned are you about this extraordinary sudden eruption of US-China tensions and trade wars? I would largely agree that this is more, and Trump is more of a symptom, Brexit is more of a symptom of what is a larger shift in the global tectonic plates that you are all in charge of navigating. So congratulations on living in, in this interesting time. But for the 20 years that Eurasia Group has been tracking political risk, what we have noted systematically with our global political risk index is that for the first time, we are seeing heightened levels of political risk emanating from developed market economies. That explains the rise in protectionism, largely being driven by developed market economies. The rise of populist and nationalist leaders, not just in developed market economies, but largely that's where we're seeing a good deal of that, of the trade protectionism and confrontation emanating from. And I think a key question that you had actually um, raised is how are emerging market economies going to respond to this rising protectionism from what they see as the old world, from the established economies? How are they going to respond? And what does that mean for how you are interacting with those emerging market economies as those new trade flows are being rejiggered? But it goes deeper than just trade, and it goes deeper than just tariffs. I think we're also beginning to see a rise of more of a politicized industrial policy that is in part embedded in the competition between the US and China, um, what we would call, let's say, the, the competition over innovation supremacy. Who, which of these economies is going to lead the strategic sectors of the future? And as such, the politicization of industries does have implications for investment flows, for where companies uh, are going to position their manufacturing and production into the future. And I think we need to spend some time thinking about that here as a group and determining how we as a maritime industry are going to respond to that. May, may I quickly Absolutely. just yes, add, yeah. just, um, just merge what Meredith has just said with what, what I mentioned earlier. You know, for those of us who've been around long enough, you know, this era that we're coming up to is reminiscent of the era of the textile quotas. Mm -hmm. You know, that is an era in which, you know, frankly, we went, to we went to Mauritius, then we went to Madagascar, then we went to Africa, and as a result, we're operating in 50 countries today. It was all from that period. And it's all about the country of origin, but it actually, the assessment now is geopolitical. Which are the countries in which you, in a sense, be safe? so to speak, 
in terms of securing a longer-term production base. So actually, it all fits in. But the assessment of which countries you can move to is geopolitical. I think that's a great point. And it's, you know, these days, Washington is swathed in ironies. And one of the most peculiar ironies that I certainly did not foresee is the fact that you have a Republican government which is increasingly talking about trade with quasi-socialist overtones. They're talking about actual managed trade. They're talking about quotas and targets and things like that, using language we've not seen for a number of decades. And it's really quite extraordinary in terms of the implications of where we may be going in the future. And, of course, the question about industrial policy mm. is rising to the fore with the U.S. and China when you look at the high-tech sector and issues like AI in particular. But we talked a lot about the U.S. and Europe. Tell us, Alethea, about... Sorry, we talked a lot about U.S. and China. Tell us, um, Alethea, about Europe, because Europe has a very interesting role to play in this current situation. Yep. Oh, interestingly, I think... You know, I heard uh, Madame Harry Lam uh, talking about the two largest economies in the world, and it so happens that Europe is actually larger. We forget, but we are. Uh, it so <coughs> happens we're so many countries, and we seem to be divided on how to approach this trade war. But it is very clear to me, and it's very clear to the Chinese leadership, which basically have spent two weeks in Brussels lately. I, I was happen to be in that... Uh, accompanying that delegation, they, they know that Europe can tilt the balance. Maybe not in the future. That will be the very famous Belt and Road, but that's not where the money is today. That's not where the consumers are today. That's where the consumers will be. But the problem is today. China has no problem. If it manages to escape the middle income trap, they're fine. They have enough consumers of their own. They don't need any more consumers around. But they do need consumers today. And that's why they're desperately knocking at the door of Europe to be sure that Europe doesn't simply, which is very easily, very easy to happen, balance towards the US, i.e. imposes additional tariffs. We do have tariffs. Let's not forget we do have very relevant tariffs on steel, anti-dumping tariffs. We started before the US, mm. but we went to the WTO. We didn't do it unilaterally. Yeah. Europe would never do it unilaterally, in my opinion. And because there's not WTO around now, the question is, how are we going to do it now? How can we balance towards the US without imposing tariffs that way? But uh, to make a long story short, I think what Europe does will be of essential, really, to know whether this is a real battle for China. Right. The, the question, though, is that it's not only about final products. And I agree that rules of origin P, uh, play a key role. The, the, the next boomerang, the 200 billion not yet uh, applied but already confirmed, is all about intermediate goods. And it's actually low-end intermediate goods. So that's going to have a massive effect in this industry. Because it's going to imply that if I happen to do what Samsung did in, 2000, in 2008, I don't wait until 2018, I would have been so much better off to produce in Vietnam and re-export to the US. Mm. Whoever didn't take that decision then is worse off. So, so there will be a lot of reshoring elsewhere. Maybe not the US, maybe Mexico, maybe Vietnam, maybe... And as we move on, and you need to decide, because if you're in Vietnam, you have through three, three free trade agreements or, or trade agreements, Europe, US, Europe not yet ratified, unfortunately, but US and China. So China could produce from the US, re -export, uh, from Vietnam re-export to the US. Will that work? No. Why? Rules of origin. Huh. So meaning, it, would, it is not enough for China to to export to Vietnam. China will need to produce in Vietnam to avoid the rules of origin. So there's going to be massive reshifting of production beyond 3D, meaning this is just about tariffs. So I think we'll see a lot of investment in other places to produce. Europe may, may want to produce much closer, not all the way to Vietnam. So I think it's going to be like more of a three regions, shorter routes for the industry, 
maybe. And, and yeah, maybe Europe tilting the balance if, if it happens to follow the US uh, approach right. to China, which we are very close to following. Very, very close to following. Well, I'm very curious about this. I mean, first of all, it strikes me that if you're trying to look at what's happening within a bigger historical sweep, really the last few decades until about 2016 were marked by this rising sense of globalization. Now what we're seeing is a new theme of localization. And I suspect yeah. that's going to just intensify in the next decade. Localization, not globalization, being the key both manufacturing mantra, but also political mantra. But the question I'd like to ask you in particular, Aditya and the others is, talking to American business leaders in the last couple of months, I've noticed quite a shift in their tone, in that when Donald Trump first started talking about rising protectionism and a US-China trade war, there was horror from the American business community. Today, there's a growing belief amongst the CEOs that I've spoken to that actually there is a need to take action against China. This is an American perception. But they are desperate to do so with other allies. And there's a great hope that having signed the NAFTA 2.0, that essentially Canada and others will come on board. There's a great hope that they can work with Europe. So the question I have both Alethea and all of you is, do you think we're going to see an effective US-European platform moving against China? Or is it going to still be the US operating in a unilateral way? Uh, Europe has already changed its tone on China in 2016. If you read the European Parliament statement, so it's a white paper on China, both the Commission and the Parliament, expressed serious doubts about China's economic model. Whether they are right or not, I'm not getting into that one. But I, what I know is that they've changed their view of China even before Trump. Just that Europe doesn't do things the way Trump does them. So what they're doing is they wrote a massive report uh, last year on why China was not a market economy. Yeah. Um, so Trump, so, you know, they are ready. In, uh, what I'm trying to say is they are ready. Now, would Europe um, align with things that they think are not multilateral? Maybe not. So I think Trump would need to get closer to multilateralism for Europe to follow. Will that happen? But the point that Europe, and, and again, at this Bruegel, I, I, I'm affiliated with Bruegel, a think tank in, in Brussels, um, we had ex-governor uh, Joe Xiaochang uh, talking to uh, the panel, and he insisted that SOEs are not SOEs, that China is a market economy. You know, nobody was listening. In Europe, is just nowhere close to believing that we're getting closer. So this is why I don't know whether it will be an alliance, but what I know is that without an alliance, still uh, Europe won't align with China on basically uh, isolating the US. I don't think that's going to happen. Right. Yeah. Meredith, do you expect to see a US-European front against China? I would think that the chances of US, Europe, Japan, and other partners having some kind of coalition that is speaking to China. I think that the prospects of that increases when Donald Trump's unilateral approach of tariffs against China ultimately fails. And my sense is we're going to see momentum toward that next year. Um, our call is there's about a 45% chance that President Trump is actually going to move forward with tariffing almost all or all of China's exports to the United States by the end of the first half of next year. And there's an overconfidence in Washington looking at China's slowing economy, looking at the measures that Beijing is, is taking to ease the economic fallout from the tariffs that have already been implemented. There's an overconfidence that Beijing is finally going to come to the table and talk about these problematic industrial policies that are not just the concern of the US, but of other trading partners as well. I see that as a fundamental misreading. And for those of you that paid attention to President Xi Jinping and his speech in the Northeast uh, last week, where he said, fine, trade confrontation, 
This just means we need to be more self-reliant. We're going to double down on indigenous innovation. We're going to dig in our heels. And if you talk to you know, Chinese counterparts, um, there is a quiet confidence in Beijing that they will be able to wait out this tariff confrontation. They just need to wait, and that they have enough tools at their disposal to mitigate the fundamental damage to that economy. So essentially, when the US president implements tariffs on all of China's goods, and is still not having the conversation that he wants to have with President Xi over the industrial policies and the future of the strategic sectors of growth, that's when I think you're going to see this renewed intensity. Already, Washington is comparing notes with European capitals, with other trade allies. Those conversations are happening, but it's comparing notes. It's not necessarily a concerted effort to speak with one voice, with Beijing. I think that could, vi could very well change. And I th what you would also need to watch for is the extent to which the Europeans are successful and Japan is successful in channeling the US toward having these conversations in the WTO and using that as a reforming mechanism of the WTO. Right. Well, if you're saying there's almost a 50-50 chance of having complete tariff, blanket tariffs, um, that's very significant for businesses. And I must say, I don't think that American business has fully prepared or taken that on board, what the implications of that would be. Um, I do sense this tremendous sense of overconfidence right now um, amongst the American business community, partly because of a rising stock market makes everyone feel wonderfully optimistic. But, um, Victor, I'm curious about you. Do you think that people in the region have prepared for a potential worsening of this trade war? Uh, yes, I think at the, uh, at the very superficial level, if you would. I'm a businessman, so I, I don't have the deep political analysis that the, you know, our friends have. But you know what I really see, the fundamental backdrop, I think is for the world to really think again about a updated multilateral system. It is about time we go back to the repairing of that. I think that to me is the ultimate. So this, the, the, the question I would ask the Europeans is, you know, do you subscribe to a policy of playing the, all this globally as a zero sum game? Or really a little more cooperatively in a global multilateral system that would benefit Europe and everybody else? That, I think, is the mm. people will come to that ultimate realization. On the, first surface, on the surface, yes, there's politics, you want to get elected, uh, you know, and then you, you, you have the populism, and so that you've got to, in a sense, deal with. But I think at the end of the day, that is, to me, the question. But so, so what I'm seeing, again, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit thinking on, on the more uh, longer term and maybe more optimistic side is, is this an opportunity? for the world to now think through what is the future multilateral system that we need to morph to. It has been served us well for 70 years at least, and it has been gone a little bit into disrepair in the last 10 years at least, and it is in the need of an updating. Will these events now trigger the world to go into the path of rethinking a multilateral world, and what is that new multilateral system? especially taking account of the biggest problem I see confronting the world is the inequality, the 99%, the 1%, and a multilateral system that is inclusive that would deal with that issue. Of course, that begs the question on who on earth is going to lead the search for a new multilateralism, because right now it's certainly not going to be Washington. I don't think Europe shows much sign of wanting to show any leadership <laughs> role. I mean, they're trying to hold Europe together and Asia doesn't show that either, do they? That's the key problem. Nobody's there to do exactly what Victor said we should do, which I fully agree with. Nobody's there to do it, but we need it. Yeah, that's, um, but I wanted to add something, if you allow me, on the fact that, and I don't know what Victor thinks, because basically it's, it's kind <laughs> of a different business, but if everybody goes back to thinking that trade will be difficult, that we have everybody on tariffs. Yeah? Um, what is happening today will only accelerate, and that what is buying companies all over the world, yeah? especially China. Can, and, can. and that's where, just a second, China is buying 
to a large extent, European industrial sector. That's what they're buying, 2018 in particular, 2017. So is that going to continue? What are we going to do about it? Hey, I, can, I'd like to jump in here. In fact, Alicia finished the second half of my story. You know, we're, we're, we're talking at this level, but underneath the intermediate goods flow, I'm relating it more to the industry now, is going to be huge. And when you think about, you know, fighting trade wars and so on, we're no longer in a world in which 100% of any product is complete in any country. You know, a product could go through five countries before it becomes a product. That's why it's a different world. So you may be fighting up here in what I call the final stage on where it's country of origin and the finishing. That's 30% of the value added. And that, I think, is not going to stop the cauldron of activity. And I'm saying increase activity in terms of the intermediate goods and the, and the movement of manufacturing. I don't know anybody can stop that. Well, that's a you great know, point. Uh, see, yes. see, that's the whole point. And, and now I want to relate it to trade and maybe the movement of cargo. What I see is really the pattern of trade changing. It's movement among the people that would participate in the submerged version part of the supply chain, if I can call it that. Mm -hmm. And it's going to stretch more and more to the developing economies. Right. You see? And then that, that's the world that I'm seeing. So... I'm going to bring in some people from the floor in a moment, but before I do, if you were giving advice, top tips to this group here for what to prepare for, what would be your top recommendation right now? What would you tell them all to prepare for? <laughs> well, I, all I can say is, you know, I don't know how familiar you are with the Belt and Road Initiative. You know, sometimes it's in the, in, in the Western media, it could be dressed up as, you know, a Chinese... A political initiative. I, I tell you, as a businessman, I see a huge opportunity. You know, what it is, is half, it's 70 countries, link about half the world's population, about a third of the world's GDP, and about a third of the world's consumption. And this movement that we just talked about, in my mind, is going to be spread along the Belt and Road. Yeah. And then the other trend I want to bring in is, in my mind, the consumption that is now happening in the you know, developing economies because of the growth of the middle class. It's not just China, it's China, it's ASEAN, it's India, and then all the others. We have a term in Li and Fung, we, we, we call it the ABC, the Asian-based consumer strategy. And that is going to be a new trend in the world. See, in, in, in the past, we have concentrated on, in a sense, you know, my whole life has been thinking about serving the consumer in the U.S. and America and doing the production out here. Now, it's actually sure we're going to continue that for sure. Right. But we're going to see a new trend. And that, I think, will be, you know, the biggest opportunity and also, and that, the platform to access that right. will be the Belt and Road. Okay, so your top tips are... Learn all about the Belt and Road and think about the ABC, Asian-based consumer. ABC, right. Meredith, what's your top tip for this audience? <laughs> Other than obviously subscribe to Eurasia. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually I just have one word, and that is agency. And it's a word that I've used in discussions with GMF colleagues as well when we talk about your power as a maritime industry, 90% of global trade. You're very pragmatic. You're nimble, you can be. And in a multipolar world where you are seeing the erosion of the effectiveness of multilateral institutions, some of your greater development goals, environmental goals, are going to face headwinds when you don't have strong international multilateral institutions that are driving those forward. Don't despair, organize and think about how you as a group, a non-political, commercially-minded, growth-oriented group, how are you banding together to realize where these opportunities are and then coming together to make them happen? And one sort of example of that, if I may riff off the, the um, infrastructure development that we're seeing, not just in this region, but will continue to see grow beyond. Uh, you do have a role, you're a stakeholder. Even if you may not think about it that way, 
And the question I have for you is, what are you doing to engage country governments on the choices that they're making about port and infrastructure development? Are they making the right kinds of choices that would enable the most efficient or most global orientation for their particular port, given their trade industry, given what they have in mind? You have a role to play. You have a seat at that table if you want it. And you have these other country governments that would take your views and consider them as they make decisions about who is going to invest in our infrastructure, where are we going to place that infrastructure, how are we going to reorient our economy, and this is in particular emerging market economies who are still very much reliant on trade for onward growth. So just think about agency. Well, that's fascinating. I mean, essentially, don't rely on governments to do it for you. Don't rely on governments to to lead the push for multilateralism, look for ways within the industry to basically try and keep forging. Like this connections. forum. Exactly. <laughs> um, this forum is, makes it doubly important. Alethea, what message would you have to the group um, or advice? Same messages um, I give every day to my kids. Basically, keep it simple, meaning reduce, I tell them, reduce the bulk of stuff. Here I would say fixed asset investment, being involved. Reduce your roots shorten your routes, because the business will be in shorter routes, in my opinion, and uh, go for newer routes. Follow, I think, three things. BRI, uh, uh, Europe-Asia uh, connectivity plan, and uh, the Indo-Pacific um, strategy. I think these three things will reshape the world. Uh, so you can't be sitting on the routes you know, because they're going to change. Right. Well, that seems like a good moment to bring in some of our participants in the audience. And we were having a discussion, very lively discussion earlier, um, about some of these key themes. I know that, Klaus, you have a number of thoughts about the issue of simplicity, don't you, or simplifying in the current era. I think Klaus is known to all of you um, from Musk. Do you want to say a couple of words about that? Yeah, just uh, picking on the... Uh, on, on you know, what you're saying is the proof that this forum is an excellent opportunity to, to actually exchange views across... Uh, multiple industries and, and be between uh, think tanks and, and specialists and, as Victor is saying, business people that are practical and trying to, to get the job done. I think I'd like to take the, um, the sort of uh, trade facilitation angle because all we are talking about is, of course, the challenges uh, to trade. And as uh, the maritime industry, we thrive on free trade. There's no doubt that, uh, that our thriving of that is also what the global economy thrive on. So if you look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals to 2030, it's all about economic development, job creation, and raising people out of poverty. Well, globalization is rather accepted as the, uh, global trade is rather accepted as the tool to do that. And shipping carries 80% of global trade. There's $16 trillion of goods moving every year across borders. In Maersk, we believe that simplification is key to this. So on a high level, yes, you have the polarization between countries, you have the, all the origin manufacturing issues, but if we can simplify the way that we do trade, we, we believe that that is a great opportunity and, and not to promote anything, but an initiative like the Maersk IBM Trade Lens, where we now have more than 100 companies signed up and we have more than 165 million transactions uh, since the beginning of this year. That is an issue that can help simplify uh, global trade. People always ask for an example. So if we track a container movement of avocados from Kenya to Rotterdam, there's more than 30 entities involved, 30 agencies or companies or government institutions <coughs> involved. There's more than 100 people involved. I'm talking one shipper, one container, and one destination. And there's more than 200 information exchanges involved in that one shipment. If we can simplify that and make it possible, then the World Economic Forum has estimated that just taking it half the way to uh, regional best practices will actually increase global EDP by 5%. So one of the focuses that we are trying to combat all the things that hits us from the political scene is actually trying to simplify the way we do trade, and there's great opportunities there. If we just make one more comment in the small scale of things, because we are talking about what we can do, uh, Small and medium-sized enterprises have a huge role to play here. And uh, uh, various researchers are suggesting that they actually pay up to six times the logistics cost 
as the big multi, uh, multinationals, but they are responsible for about two-thirds of the jobs that are existing in this world. If we simplify the trade, it will be much more conducive for the small and medium enterprise companies to actually play a bigger role. And that way we may be curbing the uh, political challenges that we face. Oh, thank you, Klaus. Well, I guess a key mantra is keep it simple, stupid, that KISS <laughs> mantra, which um, works very well in politics and in business. But now, obviously, one aspect of that is data and using the digital revolution. Um, I'd like to call on Tan Jong Meng to say a few words about this, because you've been looking at the data issue in great detail, and of course, how the shipping does or does not respond to the digital revolution is going to be absolutely crucial. Well, I think a lot of discussion this morning has uh, indeed centered on the macro side of trade and how it affects supply chain. And Klaus has uh, uh, very well uh, put the response of supply chain that we need to do our part, keep it simple, and we do have a, a lot to play with how economy gets stitched up. Uh, my view on um, the, the topic is like this before I get to data, that... <clears throat> Trade-related impact and implications uh, come and go. They run a course, and then things change again. Uh, in fact, the key point is multilateralism, how we actually establish the right answer for the right times of our global development. But there are two other things that are perpetual, and they will continue to uh, advance regardless of transient changes in trade. Huh? Uh, one is technology. Uh, so while people may be manufacturers, uh, may be changing their global map of how they produce in order to duck uh, trade implications, uh, they are also driven by the changing forces of technology. They will determine the type of jobs uh, that will ultimately get reshored. So if you're talking about Adidas and Speed Factory, it's very different from the global supply chain related to traditional manufacturing. So that's another force I think we have to contend with. It's in one of your top five themes. And then finally, data. I believe the world is just beginning to discover the benefits of uh, data and learning also how to manage the after effects of data. Uh, we have to be quite careful with that. Within the industry, I don't think that uh, we are multilateral enough yet to be able to fully exploit the benefits of data. And we need to work towards that. Trade lens may be one example. We are working on other examples. But there's already an area of data that is driving manufacturing and supply chain quite a bit, and that's e-commerce and the rise of the millennials. Uh, I, I find that in the last year or so, nobody talks about the millennials very much anymore. Or maybe I'm in the wrong circles. <laughs> or maybe the millennials have grown up and become more like us, so we find them normal. But actually, um, e-commerce is driving quite a lot of fundamental changes in uh, not just how they're produced, but the product life cycle, uh, the size of the batches, the reach to markets. And that's, I believe, is another perpetual. And whether or not the um, political powers try to drive changes to define political supremacy, uh, these are underlying perpetuals that I think as a supply chain industry we need to respond to, both to respond to already whatever is already taking place, but also to consider for ourselves whether we are indeed guilty of being unable to establish enough multilateralism in a right way to in future really gain the benefits of data. Now, why? just one minute. Why is it so difficult for us? Because if you think about an Uber transaction, it needs probably six to ten points of data. You're done. If you go to... A say an Abacus, an Amadeus, or a Sabre uh, transaction that just does airline bookings, maybe 30, 40 points of data, interchangeability between airlines, and you're done. One container is several hundred points of data, viewed differently, required differently, and needs to fill up different cells through its entire chain. And that doesn't happen today, and will not happen in the future unless we have some degree of collaboration. Right. Thank you. I can see as part of our collaboration exchange that Victor mm -hmm. is dying to get in with a no, comment. No, no I, I, I just agree so much with what both speakers have said. You know, what it means to me is the world is already totally integrated. And Klaus, if we facilitate the integration more, especially involving the SMEs, especially using technology, there's nobody that could separate that. 
You see the debate, you talk about the trade war. Can any country police all five stages of the supply chain? You know, you can, you can police the final destination and slap duties on the final destination. How are you going to do this? The whole thing, see, it, it's, it, th this whole concept that you use trade war and tariffs on was, was developed in an old world in which everything was manufactured in one country, and you can control it. Now, nothing is manufactured in one country, okay? So I, I think, and that's the whole thing, it's already, the whole underneath the surface, everything is already integrated. And it's in our interest to really facilitate more of that integration and actually spread the wealth to even more countries. And that has to be the ultimate basis of a global multilateral system. Because right, so that's the, the people, that's, that's the world. So and and these guys are fighting up here. <laughs> Those are the ultimate yeah. rates on debt to the shipping industry right now. So yeah. I'm sure you're speaking to the choir here or speaking to the converted. <laughs> but one question before I turn to Christine, and I want to bring you in the moment, Christine, but... Um, those of you who haven't yet looked at the in issues monitor, which was handed out to you, um, first of all, do look at it because it's a very interesting survey about what the top concerns are of the maritime industry. But the issue which emerges at top of the list in terms of concern, both in terms of likelihood and potential impact, is cyber security, cyber hacking, cyber risks. So I'd just like to quickly ask maybe Tan or the others to, to reflect on this because this is one area where collaboration is crucial, but where there hasn't been much discussion yet. How concerned are you about the risk of a major event disrupting either parts of the industry or potentially the wider global supply chains or causing to a bre bigger breakdown of trust? Anyone, anyone want to jump in, either Tan or any of, any of you? I would say very, or, very... Or, or, or Klaus. I know for Klaus it's a very, very... Um, <laughs> painful personal issue. So tell us how you feel about it. Painful and personal, and <laughs> uh, I think personal for just about 70,000 people engaged with it last year. So uh, no, I, I think it's uh, the cyber risk is, is, is definite, and it's, uh, and it's here, and it's here every day, and I think most companies uh, do not realize how profound it is, and, and uh, we could probably give a two-hour lecture about our experience, but I, I, th I just warn everybody to, to uh, you know, take the greatest care in looking at your, at your, at your data, your compliance, and, and your, your systems, and whatever you inter whoever you interchange data with, uh, because the, the risk to your business is, uh, is, is ultimate. So, so uh, we had, a, uh, we had a, uh, the good fortune that we managed the uh, cyber attack last year. I think we have uh, put out that it cost us $300 million. Uh, big disruption for our customers, uh, but the risk is real, and, and I think the, uh, the level of protection we found out uh, is, is uh, just so much above what, uh, what we could have foreseen. So I don't really know what, what I can add to it other than, than confirming that the uh, cybersecurity risk, and we are not you know, particularly worried about a ship or a navigation, but it's, it's really the risk to your business because your data flows uh, and your whole integrity of your, of your data can be jeopardized. I, I think, Julian, that it's really the other side of the coin of digitalization. Yeah. If we live in a completely analog world, everything's pen and you've completely diversify your risk. So we gotta recognize that the efficiency that you get from this age of digitalization is a high risk, high return strategy. Absolutely. You know, you gotta protect it. See, both Meredith and Tan want to come in. Well, first of all, I would just want to say that what your company went through and how quickly you were able to turn that around was truly remarkable. And I think an example for the rest of us as we think about what, how we need to prepare ourselves in this age of, of great cyber risk. One of the things I, I want everybody to keep in mind is that, yes, there are commercially focused cyber hackers, but the most dangerous ones that we see are cyber hacking for political reasons which is the source of NotPetya. Yeah. That is critical. And in the last uh, year or two, there was a, a leaking of US government intelligence community cyber hacking tools on WikiLeaks, which means that commercial actors, government actors, non-commercial actors, they all have access to these kinds of tools. That's very dangerous. 
the perception of a country that has been attacked, whose infrastructure has been attacked, you have to keep that in mind as well. Uh, there was a simulation not, not too far after the WikiLeaks uh, release of these hacking tools where uh, this is sort of an NGO environment where we were trying to ascertain if there is a major attack on a global port, what happens? And of course, yes, global trade was disrupted. Billions of dollars lost. Confusion, chaos. But what was also something that took us by surprise was the host country government saw it as a political attack on their country and were on the verge of waging war against another country that they thought was a source of that hack, which very well could not have been. So as these cyber risks emerge, it's a risk to your, to your industry, it's a risk to your firm, but, but be aware of some of the broader political implications of the use of those, of those hacking tools as well and what that might mean in terms of future instability. Right. Tan, and then I'm going to bring in Christine. Yeah, just, just a very uh, quick rejoinder to uh, Klaus sharing of his experience. Um, we learned a lot from the MERS experience, thanks for sharing. And we, the one thing that we realized is we focused previously very much on protection. But after the MERS experience, we realized that we need to challenge our cybersecurity management system, not on the basis of protection, because we know we are being hacked, and we know that at some point we'll have a failure, but rather to work on recovery. And it's quite different whether you work from protection forwards or you work from recovery backwards. And on the aspect of working on recovery, impact assessment, and the capability of line managers, not IT people, but line managers to know with uh, what actually are the operational and business impacts are uh, critical. So I thought I'd just, you know, add that right. thought to what Klaus said. Well, Klaus, you said you didn't want to give us a two-hour lecture about your experience. I suspect that for this group, if you were to give a two-hour lecture, you'd probably have a rapt audience and it would turn into a mutual therapy session. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm sure people will be gra grabbing you over lunch to talk about that. And as I say, if you do look at the I issues monitor, it does indicate that cybersecurity is top of most of your minds, and clearly it's something which needs to be discussed in the breakout sessions. But before we do that, I'd like to bring Christine in, because um, we were chatting earlier, Christine Lowe, um, we were chatting earlier about China, and looking at China, not so much through the lens of the China-US trade conflict, which of course has been top of our minds, but looking at China's wider vision for the maritime industry and the maritime economy. And I'd like you to just say a few words about that, because given that we are sitting in Hong Kong right now, it does cast this debate into a sort of slightly more positive um, aspect, looking at the global economic implications. Yes. Well, I'll see if I can do that. Um, a quick prediction. Because China has announced in the last couple of years that it expects that by 2030 that China would have achieved really essentially modernization and, and China has listed out what that means and that includes uh, making China 2025. So I predict that continuing in the future years you're going to see many, many new Chinese policies being announced. This covers many, many areas. So for example in the maritime area you are going to see continuing tightening of uh, environmentally related policies. You are going to see a reimagination of what China means by ocean economy. China sees that she has a she has the coast. Um, she has and coming back to the Hong Kong area, Victor talked about the Greater Bay Area, which is one of the most vibrant and important economic areas in the world now and not just in manufacturing. The Chinese government is reimagining all the policies that relates to the fact that she's a coastal country. And she's called this an ocean economy, going out. And it's everything from replanning the coast to climate change, to manufacturing technology, to thinking about sailing out through the Arctic. It's all of that for China. And it's about making friends. And I think we all know because China is and has been 
a developing economy, making friends to other countries uh, that are developing country uh, economies are ve have always been very important to China. So you're seeing China re-engaging much more aggressively and actively, uh, also in response to the trade war, with BRIC countries, with countries in Asia and elsewhere. So I think uh, Victor's story of how um, relationships are going to be uh, realigned, strengthened, reimagined, it's all going to be happening at great speed for China. So my conclusion is it is really important for people in global businesses to truly understand Chinese policies. The good thing is China tells you exactly what she plans to do. So these very boring and long documents, you know, the uh, five-year plans, uh, these various white papers, these various documents that are being pumped out all the time, they are critical, critical reading and understanding for people in business. So once you've digested Trump's tweets, you can then read a long Chinese policy document <laughs> or a European Commission committee report. Um, uh, certainly. Let me just give one example. You know, there's so much talk about uh, Made in China 2025 now. The entire document was put on the web four years ago. Entire document. And nobody said anything about it, and all of a sudden, this thing came. So I, I just want to reinforce everything is actually on the web. Alicia, do you have any comment on this? I realize you haven't jumped no, in. No, I, I very much agree that uh, without really, it's not really about China for China, it's China for the world. So the very first thing we need to know is what China is going to do for the world. So I can't agree more. Um, China Manufacturing 2025, the European Chamber wrote a piece that was actually what people probably read rather than the actual document, which was very negative on, on, on that uh, thing well before the trade war, on the basis that key European industries would be harmed because China had basically uh, put a very, very large uh, percentage of local uh, production. Uh, this was, of course, the automobile industry for Europe and, and well beyond. So, yes, uh, some people did read it, but they were very negative about it. Whether that is the actual reading of the document is the key question. So we should go back to the original sources, probably. Yeah, that's right. right. Well, it's been a fascinating discussion. Um, I must say, when I've been listening to the discussion and listening to what Victor said um, earlier, what I'm brought to mind about is actually a wonderful Japanese concept. I spent many years of my life in Tokyo earlier, which is a difference between tatamai and honne. I don't know if there are any Japanese um, representatives in the audience, but tatamai and honne in Japanese means the outward appearance of things and the inner reality. And the outward appearance right now of the global trading system is that we have a trading system in a state of shock or crisis with trade wars and very dramatic protectionist rhetoric thrown around and lots of melodrama, the kind of thing that newspapers love to summarize and put in their headlines in a quite sensationalist way. Um, but the honne, as Victor said and the others have echoed, is that many of these shifts and realignments have been underway and building for some time in terms of reshaping the supply chains. And in spite of all the dramatic threats, in spite of the fact that we have a 50-50 chance, or almost 50-50, of a complete um, blanket tariffs on China, and an escalation of the US-China um, cold trade war, if you like, um, the honne, the reality is that there's so much integration already in the global system that that is likely to simply intensify but in a slightly changed form, maybe localization, regional supply chains rather than globalized supply chains is going to be the growing theme. Um, that, of course, raises big questions about the environment, about digital technologies, about cybersecurity, about many themes. And the other issue we've heard very clearly, other point we've heard very clearly from the discussion is that the industry can't look to government to provide the solutions right now. Yes, we need more multilateralism and collaboration, but no, 
the governments are not about to provide that. I would love to think that someone's going to stand up on the government stage and create a new 21st century global order. I think the chances of that are extremely low right now. So it really does rest with you lot. And what we're going to do now is to move forward into breakout groups and ask you to provide some solutions and ideas about how to push this forward.